Well, I want to welcome everyone who's joining us in Oak Creek, Franklin, and online, and everyone here in Greenfield. It is so great to be here with you today. If we haven't yet met, my name is Tyler, and I serve as one of the pastors here at the Ridge. And uh, hey, I hope everyone's been having a good summer so far. Uh, my family and I, we've been having a really great summer. It started when we went on a, a road trip uh, throughout the Midwest, and so we were visiting uh, several different states like Ohio, Indiana, Michigan, um, as well as Wisconsin, and that was a lot of fun. And then we've also been spending the summer just hanging out a lot with uh, different friends, family members, neighbors, and uh, we just recently celebrated uh, both my kids' birthdays. Their birthdays are like within 10 days of each other, and so we've had three different birthday parties with friends and families and kids over at our house. We just finished, I call it the birthday gauntlet, you know, as we just wrap that up, but uh, it, it's been a really good summer, and we get to go into this final stretch of summer uh, by having a good time by kicking off this brand new series called On the Run. And so so to kick off the series, here's what I want to do. I want to ask you this question, and you can tell me if this is you by uh, raising your hand. If this is you, Oak Creek Franklin, you can do the same thing. Online, you can leave us a comment. But by show of hands, how many of you would consider yourself a runner of some type? All right, there's a few hands that are going on, you know, around here. It doesn't matter the distance, you know, you, you runner of some type. Um, here, here's how I know uh, that someone is either a runner or a crossfitter. You just talk to them for five minutes. They can't help but bring it up. They got to talk about it. Now, I can make a joke like that because I'm a runner. I, I enjoy uh, spending time uh, r running. In fact, uh, I've been running for several years. And then in 2020, uh, when the pandemic happened and all the gyms kind of shut down, running was really the only exercise I could do. And so I was doing that and I actually connected with some other neighbors in our neighborhood. And uh, we, we became friends and we started deciding to like train for marathons together. So the running just ramped up. And for me, it has just become this life-giving hobby as I've just been training for different races and different events. But whether you consider yourself a runner or not, the good news is, is that this series actually is called On the Run because we're going to learn from one of the most famous runners of all time. And I promise it's not about physical running. Uh, this type of running uh, that we'll actually see is from this guy named Jonah, who is most famous for actually running from God. And Jonah's story is actually told to us. It's found in the Old Testament part of the Bible. And so his story is actually thousands of years uh, before uh, Jesus um, actually came around. And, and what's interesting about Jonah is that if you're familiar with the Bible or not, my bet is, is that maybe you've heard a little bit about uh, Jonah's story. Uh, Jonah is most, uh, one of his most well-known parts of the story is him getting swallowed by this uh, fish and being in there for a few days and getting spit out and living to tell about it. And for some of us, that's where we're like, eh, I don't know if I can go there with this story. I'm not sure if that's true. How much can we really learn uh, from Jonah if that really happened? And if that's you, I, 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 I get that. And I just want to acknowledge this up front because for some of us, this might feel like a stretch to go there. Now, me personally, I'll just share this right away. I believe Jonah's story actually happened. And there's a few reasons why I believe that. One is, if you start looking at science right now, scientifically, there, there's some evidence that this could theoretically happen. In fact, uh, um, st uh, there's some whales that actually have some mouths that are big enough to swallow a person whole. Um, and then they even have these stomach chambers that are large enough in theory to actually hold a person uh, for a while there. In fact, uh, a couple years ago, uh, there was this diver, Michael Packard. He, he was uh, diving in Cape Cod. He got swallowed by a whale while he was diving. He dove him down to the bottom of the ocean, then came back up in just a matter of moments and just spit him out. And thankfully, Michael Packard's alive to, t uh, to uh, talk about it. In fact, you see he's got the thumbs up there. He's loving life because he's okay. We're glad he's okay. Uh, but he got through that and uh, thankfully he's okay. But that's not the only reason uh, why, why I believe Jonah actually happened. When we read about Jonah, Jonah's actually written in this historical narrative. It's not written as this fairy tale. And, and what we see is that Jonah's a real person. Nineveh, which we will talk about in a little bit, is actually this historical city. And uh, you see this as something that historically happened. But the biggest reason why I believe Jonah actually happened is because Jesus talked about it. And Jesus used Jonah's story as a way to foretell what was going to happen to him when he was going to be killed, buried for three days, and then rise from the dead so that he could give us a new life because he showed victory over sin and death. And, and, and so I, I just kind of arrive at it this way. If we believe that Jesus actually died and rose from the dead, 
And we believe that God actually created everything, including the land and the sea. Then the idea of God using a fish in a part of Jonah's story actually doesn't seem out of the realm of possibility. However, I do also realize that there are many, many smart, smart people that would look at Jonah's story and say, hey, this feels like a figurative story to help us understand what it means to be on the run uh, from God. And you just pull out principles there. And if that's you, that's great. We're so glad that you are here. And uh, the good news for all of us is we can all learn uh, these helpful principles from Jonah's story and apply them to our life uh, today. Uh, and that, the reason for that is that for most of us, if not all of us, we've been on the run from God, and we are currently running from God. Now, some of us, we might be running from God this way. We might say, hey, I'm going to stay away from God or run away from God because I have these different doubts or science, you know, and it kind of proves these things, and I'm, I'm just going to avoid that altogether. But deep down, there's just something inside of us that we're like, yeah, I just don't really want to go there. And others of us, we're running from God or staying from God because of how we view or how we've experienced the church or church people. And we're like, I, I, I just don't want to be associated with that. Maybe you're dealing with some church hurt right now. And if that's you, I am so sorry that that hurt happened to you. And uh, we just consider it an honor and a privilege that you would trust us enough to be here today at one of our locations or watching this online uh, just to explore God again. And so we are so thankful uh, that, that you would actually take some time to do that. Now, others of us, we're followers of Jesus, and we feel like God has clearly given us the step to take. And we're like, yeah, I don't want to go there. I don't want to do that. And as a result, we're running from God that way. Now, here's what happens when we run from God. Running has never made our lives better. In fact, it often makes it worse. At the very least, it complicates things. As when we run from God, it brings this damage into our relationship with God, and it brings this damage into other relationships with other people. And so as we go through Jonah's story, uh, what we want to do is we want to go on this journey to go from running to repairing. So we can find this repair and healing in those relationships. And so that's what we're going to get out of learning from Jonah throughout this series. And we're going to start off where his story starts. Um, his story actually starts with him in this uh, place called Joppa. And Joppa is this beautiful city off the Mediterranean Sea. It's overlooking this water. In fact, it's so beautiful. Jonah's probably seen something like this when he gets this clear message from God. And here's what God tells him to do. God tells Jonah, hey, go to the great city of Nineveh and preach against it because its wickedness has come up before me. And so Jonah gets this clear message from God. And even though it's clear, it's not easy. Because what Jonah is being told to do is leave this beautiful city of Joppa and then travel up about 550 miles to the city called Nineveh. And this is a tough travel by land in and of itself, and so he's naturally not going to want to travel that far. But even more than that, Nineveh is this capital city of Assyria. And the Assyrian Empire is known for its violence and its brutality. In fact, Nineveh is nicknamed the City of Blood. And the Assyrian Empire, what they would do is they would actually build their economy based on stealing and plundering from their neighboring nations. And even more so than that, they were just ruthless and how violent they were. History tells us that the Assyrians, what they would do is they would capture people, and then as a way to mock them, they would cut off an arm and two legs and just shake the other person as a way to mock them as they would die. I mean, it's just brutal and ruthless. And so this is a tough assignment for God to give Jonah to go up there and, and, and to tell them God's message to them. And understandably, Jonah doesn't want to do that at first. And so here's what Jonah does, is he actually— um, goes and runs away from the Lord and heads for Tarshish. And Tarshish is not on the way uh, to Nineveh. In fact, what we see about uh, Tarshish, it's 2,500 miles the opposite direction for, from going there. And, and he's going by sea. And so he decides, hey, I'm going to go ahead and just go in the opposite way that God tells me to go. It's like God told him to go to present-day Iraq 
and he says, no, I'm just going to set sail and head on over to Spain. Now, I was thinking about what this would be like today, and this, and this is an imperfect analogy, you know, but, but, but you can just bear with me on this one to kind of put this picture in your mind. Imagine that there is a Packers fan just sitting by Lambeau Field. And he gets this message that he needs to go down to Soldier Field in Chicago and tell all the Bears fans why they need to become Packers fans. And this Packer fan's like, I really can't stand Bears fans. I really don't want to go to Chicago. I really don't want to go there. I'm just going to go up north to Canada. And I'm just going to hang there and, and be there. And, and, and it's kind of like similar like that. Now, here, here, Jonah heads in this opposite direction. We might wonder, well, why is Jonah doing this? And the reason is, is because he wants to avoid those people. He wants to avoid the Assyrians. And, and, and why was he going to avoid these people? Well, because he would say, yeah, they're rebelling against God and they're mistreating um, other people. But don't miss this. By doing this, by heading to Tarshish, Jonah becomes one of those people who is rebelling against God and mistreating the people that God has called him to share his message with. And so, Jonah's set sail, but God's not done with Jonah yet. Here's what happens. The Lord sends a great wind on the sea, and such a violent storm arose that the ship threatened to break it up. And all the sailors were afraid, and each cried out to his own God, and they threw the cargo into the sea to lighten the ship. And the word for send that God sent there actually doesn't do the word that was used in the original language justice. A better way to describe the word is this idea of hurling something, like throwing it really hard. This word was also used to describe how one person in the Old Testament actually took a spear and hurled it at another person to try to pin them against uh, the, the wall. So think of a, a, a pitcher just throwing this 99 mile per hour fastball towards a catcher. I mean, God is sending the wind and the storms on this boat. And, and, and here's what this means for us. For many of us, who are feeling like we are in the storms right now, the winds are coming above us, the waves are overpowering us, we might think this is a sign of God abandoning us. But actually, it's not God abandoning you or giving up on you. What we're starting to see is that we can run from God, but God's not going to make it easy on us. And God didn't make it easy for Jonah. And so here's what Jonah does when the storm starts to overpower them. Jonah actually heads to the deck below, where he lay down and he fell into a deep sleep. My thing is, why is he sleeping? I think maybe, maybe he's got that special power that dads of newborns just always seem to get. You know, like, like dads, I don't know if you got this ability. I got this ability when, when my kids were, were, were uh, very young and, and, and babies. Uh, I, I was just able to sleep. There were mornings I would wake up and I felt so refreshed after a nice eight hours of sleep. I'd look over at my wife, Andrea, and I'd say, hey, isn't it so great that our kids, you know, they just sleep through the night. They're just helping us out. And she would look at me like she wants to attack. And she said, Tyler, I've been up four times this last night, you know, and you were just sleeping right through. Like, what, what's going on? <laughs> Maybe Jonah's got that ability, but probably here's what's more likely going on. Jonah is doing whatever he can to escape the pain of his choices. And many of us, we, we, we do this. When we feel the storm come around us, we do whatever we can to escape or numb the pain. Maybe we work a little bit longer. Maybe we, we just say, hey, I'm just going to go ahead and take one more drink. I'm going to go to the pills. I'm going to find this other hobby just to distract myself from all of this. We do whatever it is that we can escape the pain that's going on around us. And Jonah might be escaping the pain by sleeping, but we aren't the only ones who's wondering why he's asleep. The captain of the boat actually comes to him and he says to Jonah, how can you sleep? Get up and call on your God. Maybe he's going to take notice of us so that we will not perish. If you're a follower of Jesus, have you ever had a moment where someone who wasn't following Jesus reminded you that you are following Jesus? Over the last few months, I've had some uh, friends of some close family members or other friends of mine uh, shoot me some Facebook messages. And they would say, hey, I'm going through this. They would describe their storm and describe what's going on for them. And, and, and they say, Tyler, I, I know that you pray and I, and, and I know that, that you, you, you believe in that and, and I really need some help right now. Hey, would you pray for me? And it was always an honor, and I always would pray and help them, you know, during, do whatever I could um, when I got those messages. But it was this reminder for me 
that it's often when we're going through the storms, we are most open to God. And so this captain, he's open for God to move, but it's not just him. There's also the sailors of the boat. And the sailors said to one another, hey, come, let us cast lots to find out who is responsible for this calamity. And so they cast lots and the lot fell on Jonah. And casting lots back then was one of their ways that they would pray. What they would do is they would ask God a question and then they would take uh, something, maybe some sticks or some rocks, and they would use each one as this representative of all the different people or all the different options for this answer. And they would start like pulling out these rocks or these sticks, maybe from a bag or something, as God's way to answer their their prayer. It's kind of like a much more sophisticated and sacred way of of spinning the bottle, you know, trying to figure out who is it going to land on, who is is going to, and and what uh, they end up seeing is they pulled out the rocks or the sticks that represented Jonah. They do it again. It was Jonah again. They do it again. It was Jonah. And so they're starting to realize, hey, Jonah's involved with this massive storm that's around them. And so they go to Jonah, and they start asking him this question. They say, Jonah, tell us who is responsible for making all of this trouble for us? What kind of work do you do? Where do you come from? What is your country? From what people are you? And Jonah answered to them, I am a Hebrew, and I worship the Lord, the God of heaven, who made the sea and the dry land. And what Jonah's beginning to tell them is, hey, I don't just know the answer to your question. I am the answer to your question. I'm responsible for for all of this. And They heard this and their emotions just went up because they realized what's all involved here. They said, hold on, what have you done, Jonah? Because they knew he was running away from the Lord because he had already told them so. And they're starting to connect the dots. They're like, oh, hold on a second, hold on. Jonah, you're running away from God and you know that he made the land and the sea that we're sailing in and you thought you'd get away from him? Hey, genius, how's this working out for you? You know, now we got this storm that we have to deal with. And what Jonah's about to experience or is experiencing is what many of us experience when we're running from God and we're trying to hold things all together. Because often, here's what we do. We think we can manage it at first. We can deal with all of the things that are going to come out with, with running from God. And we think, hey, I look good on the outside. No one notices what's going on, but everyone on the outside, they can tell that we're running from God. And we might try to explain some things away. We might say, well, it's just one more drink. You know, it's, it's just, a, I, I, I can handle that. It's, it's, it's not a big deal. Or it's just a flirtatious text. You know, I, you know it, 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 doesn't, it doesn't mean anything. It was just, it was just it, it, it's nothing to worry about. It's fine. Or I just need some personal time right now, you know? And so I'm just going to take this season off of Ridge Group. I'm going to take this season off of serving. I, you know, we got this extra schedule. You know, well, it's just going to be a season away from church. It's just going to be a season from this. It's fine. It's no big deal. Everything's going to be fine. And we do whatever we can to tell ourselves we're managing it and we're handling it okay. But the truth is we're running from God. And the truth is the truth is always going to come out. And it just came out on Jonah. And here's what Jonah is experiencing. The sea actually gets rougher and rougher. And so the sailors start asking him, well, what should we do to you to make the sea calm down for us? And they're starting to think, hey, if anyone's going to pay for this, it should be you, Jonah, since it's your fault, you know, rather than us. And Jonah actually agrees with them. And he says, here's what you need to do. Pick me up and throw me into the sea and it will become calm. I know that it is my fault that this great storm has come upon you. And Jonah's starting to acknowledge and own the fact that he is running from God. And this is one of the very first steps that we take from running to repairing is we start realizing, yes, this is, this is what I did. It's my responsibility. I need to take ownership of this. And that's exactly what Jonah does. He says, throw me into the sea. And they're like, well, we don't think we want to go that far, you know, yet. So let's just kind of wait, you know, you know, row against the waves and see how we do. And they start doing that. Well, the wind picks up even more. And so they're like, okay, maybe we need to follow through on what Jonah's telling us to do, but we need to pray to God to make sure that we're covered from this, you know, because we don't want God after us too. So they, they cry out this uh, prayer to God. They say, hey, please, Lord, hey, don't let us die for taking this man's life. Don't hold us accountable for killing him. For you, Lord, have done as you please. This is like, God, 
This is on you, not us. And so then they took Jonah, they threw him overboard, and the raging sea grew calm. And maybe you can relate to Jonah here in this moment. Maybe you feel overwhelmed and beaten down by the wind and the waves. The storm is just crashing down around you. And you think, hey, everyone around me, they would just be better off if I just wasn't around anymore. And if that's you, I need you to lean in because I want you to pay attention to what happens to Jonah after this. See, God doesn't give up on Jonah. God doesn't just move on to the next person. We don't just read about another person coming in and then all of a sudden they get to go do what God asked Jonah to do. Instead, what we see is that God continues to use Jonah. And what God is doing is he used this storm to get Jonah's attention and to help him realize that he is running from God. And this is what God does for all of us. He loves us too much to make it too easy for us to run from him. He's always going to get our attention. And I experienced this when I was running from God. And one of the times I most significantly ran from God was uh, in my early college years. And I, I made the decision to follow Jesus in high school, and I was taking steps to follow him. And then what ended up happening is we, I had some individuals come to my life who I trusted and said, hey, Tyler, we think God might be inviting you or calling you to become a pastor and to help many people follow him. And I said, absolutely not. That's a horrible idea. I'm not going to do that. And I decided, like, no, I'm going to take matters in my own hands. I went to college and studied other things. And the truth was, I was running from God. It, 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 ha it happened in a number of different ways. One, I was in this uh, dating relationship uh, with this girl that uh, we weren't fully honoring God in this relationship, but I wanted to be in this relationship, and so I wanted to be with her. And uh, so, I, so I kept that up. Um, and then I started just uh, studying for these different careers that I wanted to uh, study for. The challenge for me was I couldn't decide on anyone. So I kept on bouncing around from different class to different class to different major to different major. And then I also wanted to make a bunch of money back then. And so I had these jobs. I had the ability to schedule when I worked. And I started scheduling myself as much as I could. And it started taking me out of uh, times for my small group, out of times that I was serving. E I even missed uh, church and, and all, all the different service times because I just kept scheduling myself to make more and earn more and more and more. And as I was doing this, things started happening in my life. This girl and I, we broke up. And I got really, really lonely. I just wasn't satisfied in the college classes I was taking, the things I was studying. And then I was getting anxious and afraid for my future. And then I was getting depressed because I just wasn't sure what I was going to do and what I was going to live up to. And what was happening was this storm was coming around me and it was a result from my running from God. And what I learned, just like Jonah, and, and what we can learn is there are several things that happen to us when we run. One of the first things we realize is we're all runners. And it's one of the first steps we can take is acknowledging that we are all runners. And we run from God primarily in two ways. One way, we run from God by breaking the rules. The second way is we run from God by trying to keep all of the rules. And, and, and they both work the same way. We naturally talk about the idea of running from God as this idea of disobeying him and, dis, uh, uh, and, and breaking all of the rules he may set out for us. But we can also do this when we try to hold on the rules self-righteously so that we can get God to do whatever it is that we want him to do. Jesus talked about that in one of his most famous messages that he gave about these two sons and their dad. We know about one son, the younger brother, who runs away from, from his dad with his inheritance so he could live however he wanted to. But there was also this older son that stayed near his dad, but he was emotionally distant from him. And what he ended up doing is saying, I'm going to follow all the rules and do everything dad's way so that dad will also give me this inheritance so that I can get away from him when the time is right. And what the dad wanted was for both of them to be emotionally close to him. He wanted to reconnect them through this relationship. And I don't know which way you connect with more, whether it's by running, by keeping the rules or breaking the rules. But the reason why we run is deep down, we don't fully trust God. And we feel like our decisions, our outlook, our outcomes are better than God's outcomes. And that was me when I was running from God. I, I kind of thought, hey, I, God, I have a better idea for my future, although I didn't have a better idea uh, for my future. And then we learn the second lesson that we see in Jonah, and that is every sin has a storm attached to it. 
And I can't help but think, you know, maybe there was a moment in Jonah's story where he thought, hey, you know, I'm, I'm on the sea, I'm sailing away, I'm headed towards Tarshish, I'm okay. You know, I got away from God. We're good. And then the waves started to pick up. And so often for many of us, when we're running, we think we can handle it. Hey, I'm managing this well, this is going okay for me. And then all of a sudden, our waves, whatever that may be, start picking up a little bit harder and harder around us. See, the good news of God sending the storm is that God loves us enough to still want to get our attention. The bad news is there's still a storm that's attached to that. And God wants to get our attention because he just loves us too much. Now, what I'm not saying is that every difficulty that we go through and every hard time we go through is a result of our running. But what I am saying is that every time we run, there is going to be a storm attached to that. Uh, Tim Keller, uh, who recently passed away, but uh, he was a pastor in New York for many years. He wrote about it like this, that, that I thought is just so helpful to describe this. He says, the Bible does not say that every difficulty is the result of sin, but it does teach that every sin will bring you into difficulty. And that when we run, God is going to get our attention through, through this storm. And for me, that, that was happening when I was experiencing that loneliness, that anxiety, that fear of the future because of my running. And then we see the third lesson is that when we run, it's actually going to impact those close to us. And Jonah, when he ran, he wasn't the only one affected by that storm. The sailors, the captains, I mean, their lives were at stake because of Jonah's running. And when we're running, it's often those who are close to us who are going to be impacted by our running. Parents, when we run, it's going to impact our kids. It's going to impact our significant others when we make the choice to run from God. Many of us, we're going through a time right now, we're going through a storm right now as a result of someone else's running. Teenagers, students, this is something that, that you may often experience. You may experience the outcomes of someone else and what they're doing when they're running and you're going through a storm because of those who you choose to be close to and it's the result of their running. Now, we might hear all of this and we might think, well, this just sounds really down. You know, like this, this is a hard downer, you know, the story of Jonah, like, who, you know, how, how is this really going to go? And while it might feel like a downer at first, the good news is, is that Jonah's story, especially this part of Jonah's story, it ends in anything but a downer. It actually ends with a significant amount of hope. Because what we see is that though God used the storm to get Jonah's attention, we also see God move to give Jonah a, an opportunity to come back to him. Notice how this chapter ends, and notice the language that the author uses to choose to describe what's happening. He writes, Now the Lord provided a huge fish to swallow Jonah, and Jonah was in the belly of the fish three days and three nights. So this fish comes, and notice this isn't a punishment that God is giving to Jonah. The author used the word provided. This fish is actually a sign of God's grace and mercy. He's giving Jonah something that he didn't deserve. This is actually going to be an opportunity for Jonah to find his way back to God. Now, the accommodations of this are not that good, and we'll talk more about that ne next week. But what Jonah is experiencing is an opportunity to reconnect with his Heavenly Father. And one of the biggest lessons that, that we can learn from this story of Jonah is that you can run from God, but you can't outrun God. See, God loves us too much to let us just run and stay in the storm. He may use the storm to get our attention, but he is always going to provide a way back to him because of his grace and his mercy and his love for us. For Jonah, it was his fish. For me, thankfully, it was a close friend of mine. And this friend, uh, I bumped into him when in college and I was going through just the, the hard emotions that I was dealing with. And he said, well, let's sit down, let's talk about it. And so we started talking about it. I was just sharing with him what's going on. And thankfully, he lovingly challenged me. He said, hey, Tyler, here's what I sense going on. You're running from God right now. And while you're running, here's what you need to do because you're experiencing this storm because of your running. 
I need you to stop running. Just stop running. And he's telling me that's the first step to take on this journey to go back to this repaired relationship with God. Just stop running for him. And for many of you joining us in Oak Creek, Franklin, joining us in Greenfield and online, that's the way that God is providing a way back to him for you. It's just found in those two words. Stop running. Just to stop running. You can't manage this. You can't work your way out of this. You know, you, you don't have it all together like you think you have it all together. The storm is coming upon you. The waves are coming upon you. It's gotten your attention, but God's given you a way back to him. Just take that way and stop running. Now, there's going to be more steps to take to experience this a, a repaired relationship with God. We'll talk about those uh, throughout the rest of the series. But right now, this is going to be our first commitment, just to stop running. And so here's how we're going to wrap up our time together at all of our locations. I want everyone right now, it's just a sign of, uh, of just preparing our, 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 our own time to uh, commit to God to stop running. I want all of us to just close our eyes and bow our heads. We're getting ready to spend some time in prayer. Oak Creek Franklin, I want to encourage you to do the same. Online, you do the same. Just close your eyes, bow your head wherever you are. And I want all of us right now to get real honest with ourselves. And for those of us who are running from God, however that may be, you've been taking steps away from Him and, and maybe the wind and the waves have started to pick up for you. And you're realizing God is getting your attention. And you're ready to take the step that God has provided a way back to you, uh, back to him for you. And you're going to take that step to take, to go back to him. And you're going to do that by stopping running. Here, here's what I want you to do. If you're going to make the commitment to stop running and to surrender back to God, I want you to take a big, bold step. And I just want you to just raise your hands right now, wherever you are. Oak Creek Franklin, online, Greenfield. If you're ready, say, hey God, I've been running from you. But God, I'm going to stop running. Just go ahead and raise your hands. Make that commitment. So great to see so many hands up. If you're unsure about it, you, there's still time. You can raise your hand. Oak Creek Franklin, you can do the same thing. We're going to make that commitment to stop running. That's great. For all of you who have your hands raised right now, here's what we're going to do. We're going to wrap up our time together, and I'm going to pray for us. And I want you to make this your prayer as you commit to God saying, God, I'm taking the way back to you. I'm going to stop running. and I'm going to give myself to you. So let's pray together. And that is, God, you are so good. You are so good because you love us so much. You, you don't have to give us a second chance. You don't have to give us an opportunity to have a way back to you. But God, you love us too much to not do that. And God, we see in the story of Jonah that you provided a way back to, to you through a fish. But God, you've given us a way back to you through your son, Jesus. And so God, I pray for those of us right now who have been on the run. Right now, we're making the commitment to stop running. Father, there's some of us here right now, we have never made the decision to follow you. Uh, there's some in Oak Creek, Franklin, some joining online that um, have been maybe curious about you, checking you out, but they've still been on the run from you. And God, right now, uh, we're going to make the decision to follow Jesus for the very, very first time. And so, Father, I pray for those whose hands are raised, who are surrendering to you, who are stopped running for the very first time. To God, that we're going we're gonna to make this commitment. We're going to realize that Jesus came to live among us, to die and rise again, so that he could give us victory over sin and death, and so that we could receive a new life in him, a new life that represents a restored relationship with you. Father, we receive that gift right now. We are so grateful for that. And God, we commit right now to stop running from you. And we receive the new life and the new relationship you give on us through your son, Jesus. God, we love you. And we thank you for this opportunity. It's in Jesus' name that we pray. Amen.